Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to you to the CGM's seminar today on uh, Taliban philosophy of governance. Uh, we are lucky to have Dr. Bashir Nurasher, who is um, currently a postdoctoral fellow at the American University in Washington. Earlier, between 2018 and 2021, he has been teaching at American University in Afghanistan. Uh, he's primarily focusing on law and constitutional reform in divided societies. And the topic for today's talk is the constitution of laws of the Taliban between 94 to 2001. That is the first phase of the Taliban. I think it's quite important for us to, to unpack what's, what was going on in history in order to understand current situation in Afghanistan. We, despite the fact that we have been engaging with, I mean, I mean, the Taliban have been there in politics of Afghanistan the last 30 years. Still, it's quite difficult to predict their behavior and policies. Primarily, one of, one of the reasons is that they are behaving ideologically rather than based on predictable political evidences or behaviors. Uh, however, I think if we go back to those laws, which are to a large extent draws from Sharia, we can understand how the group thinks and how, what are, what are the, their legacy? So over to you, I think you have um, around 20 to half an hour. Feel free to speak that much and then we will go to question and answer session. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Also the participants in the Zoom. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to present uh, on this very important topic, at least important to me. <laughs> um, this presentation is basically based on a research project that I co-authored uh, with, uh, with a couple of uh, wonderful colleagues, uh, Dr. Shamshab Saleh from the University of Chicago and Dr. Baham Afkadamsha from uh, the University of uh, Seattle Pacific University. And it's published by the International Idea. This research project is based on our translation analysis and critique of over 40 laws of the Taliban um, between 1994 and 2001. Um, so the first thing to, to say about the Taliban is that it's not the first time that they're ruling Afghanistan. Their first ruling of Afghanistan was between 1996 and 2001. And during that time, they have produced laws about different issues, including women issues, for example. Uh, property, for example, system of governance, structure of the state, uh, even war and, and things like that. So and looking at these laws can give us uh, some good idea about the way of thinking and what kind of system of governance they want to have in Afghanistan. So basically, one of the first questions um, we ask is, uh, What's the purpose of governance according to the Torah? Uh, what's the government for, right? So it's a very important question. It's also in some ways a philosophical question. Uh, and in order to understand the Torah's philosophy of governance, we must begin with the most favorite phrase of the Torah, which is restoring the religion of Allah. And they usually and frequently mentions the same phrase or similar phrases in their speeches. And on a number of occasions, they have mentioned it in their laws that we are gonna go through and some of those laws and you will probably see them. And one of those laws, they say, for example, the purpose of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan movement has been to restore the religion of Allah, uh, which is, you know, uh, the translation is available on idea. 8.5.4. Now, what does restore, restoring the religion of Allah means? For the Taliban, at least means three things. First, sovereignty belongs to God, and we have to, well, the Taliban have to restore the sovereignty of God. That's the first thing they want to do. The second thing is that they want to bring Sharia law back because they don't think Sharia law existed in Afghanistan before them, or to the full extent that they want to. And the 
third thing about this restoring the religion of Allah is basically based on the presumption that Afghanistan was not Islamic, or at least not Islamic enough, according to the Taliban, and the people were not uh, Muslim enough or pure Muslim enough, according to the Taliban, which also justifies why they have killed so many innocent people, because according to them, well, their, their um, collateral damages were not informed and enlightened Muslims. So restoring the sovereignty of Allah, what does it mean? Basically, when we are living in, in democratic societies, we mostly tend to and, and believe that sovereignty belongs to the nation, to the people, and the government represents the sovereignty and the will of the people, and the government is there to protect and serve the population and the people. So that's the purpose of a government. Otherwise, why we have a government, right? But for the Taliban, the purpose for a state is different. The state is there to serve Allah, to serve God. That's the main and the most important purpose of, um, of the government. Whether protecting and serving the people is an important service of the state, that's a question. Sometimes they mention some, some part of the law, but um, other times you can, they make a lot of statements that would basically contradict it. So the first thing about serving the purpose of serving Allah or serving the religion of Allah. So there's one law that I would like to cite here. Um, this law, the translation is again available on IDEA and the official gazette is 4494. And the law basically says all sacrifices in Afghanistan have been for the sole purpose of obtaining the satisfaction of Allah and enforcing the Islamic system in this life. But, so the rest is basically, you can't see anything about, for example, providing services for the people or protecting people or representing the well of the people because that's not in their thought of how a government should run a country. This is another law by the Taliban. It's the law on the Council of Ministers, Article 1. It's actually Article 2, so I'm sorry about you know, this mistake. It's about the purpose and objective of the Council of Ministers, basically the cabinet of Afghanistan, which is the second most important um, council in the executive uh, branch of the Taliban. So as you can see, this, these, the purposes are listed here. The law shall guide and coordinate the activities of the Council of Ministers, enforcing principles of Islamic Sharia and achieve the following objectives. Objective one is realizing the goal of the sacred religion of Islam. And goal number five is extending the reach of Sharia principles and agencies and activities of Islamic Emirates. Nowhere in these objectives you can find anything about the people, protecting people, serving people, and, uh, and, and things like that. So it's pretty clear on that. As for protecting and serving the people, at one time, one reporter asked Mullah Omar, which was the first Amir of the Taliban between 1996 until even when they researched back um, um, after 2001, uh, once when he was ruling the country as the Amir of the Taliban, he was asked you know, about the poverty in Afghanistan and what's the plan of the government in order to tackle and address that particular important issue. And his answer was basically referring to one of the verses of the Quran, which basically says, uh, Allah provides for those he wills and does not provide for those he doesn't well. So something like that's so basically the plan of the government was what was mentioned in that particular verse. But recently, we can also see similar speeches by the Taliban about, for example, providing services or protecting people of Afghanistan. So this is a video, but it is translated by Habib Khan. I have not received his permission to post this translation here, but he posted it on Twitter, so it's available, it's public, so I'm gonna just use it here. And if, they, if he sees it, he, I'm, I'm sorry, but I hope he, he's, he's gonna be okay with it, right? So, so this is the translation. If the Taliban cares, so this is the Minister of Higher Education of the Taliban, the current Minister of Higher Education of the Taliban. 
He says, if the Taliban cared about people's prosperity and civilization, if this was the original goal, we wouldn't have waged war from the beginning. We would have handed over Osama and liberated women. Yes, the Taliban, so says the Taliban minister. So this is one of the speeches they made very recently. Um, another speech that was made by the Taliban minister was about providing jobs and services to the Afghans and it's read in Persian, but you know the part that is highlighted here is translated over there. So basically, he says that we provide jobs and services to the righteous Afghans, which basically makes a distinction between the righteous Afghans and the ones that are not righteous. And the righteous Afghans should pro be provided jobs, opportunities, and services. Um, and that's that's the plan. That's the goal and the objective of the state and the regime of the Taliban. So uh, they have made a number of other speeches, very similar speeches, hello. And uh, I will uh, talk a lot about them a little bit later. We have it in, in a slide. And is protecting people this the important job of the regime? I would say in some ways actually the contrary is true because for the Taliban, it's very important that people who are not enlightened, who are not informed, who are less informed, as they mentioned in one of their laws, they have to brought, be brought back to the full of Islam. And until they are brought back to the full of Islam, they can actually be harmed, they can actually be sanctioned and punished and, and imprisoned and tortured. So that's that's the idea of the Taliban. And that's why they have created this ministry, which is called the Ministry of well, in short, vice and virtue, which is basically in some ways it's translated promoting goods and preventing evils, but in short, vice and virtue. And, the, and, that, and this ministry, according to the law of the Taliban, then and now have a number of objectives and a number of duties. One of those objectives is to uphold the piety in the society. And the, the other one is to ensure that individuals adhere to Islam. So, whether it's about wearing a job, having beards, for example, wearing turbans, having traditional clothes, uh, all moral issues that we consider uh, private personal decisions are moral and religious issues for the Taliban. And the Taliban do not recognize a difference between morality and legality. So everything moral, everything religious is also legal and regulated and must be abided by the fellow citizens. So um, uh, this, I also have cited a law here which says to prevent an Islamic activities and to better uh, and run social affairs. All offenders of un-Islamic activities shall be arrested and released under the discretion of the authorities of the vice and virtue, you shall not interfere. So what's this law about? This law is basically about giving the Ministry of Verse, Vice and Virtue, which is the moral police of the Taliban, the full authority to not just be a moral police, but also be a judge, a prosecutor, an executioner. So they can on this spot decide that if you have uh, acted un-Islamically, and then they will provide a sanction. It, be, it could be flogging you on the spot. It could be put you in prison. It will be based on their decisions. And this law is made and sent to the other administrations and other offices and agencies of the Taliban regime that you cannot intervene in the affairs of the vice and virtue because they know what's right, what's not right, what's moral, what's not moral, and what's religious and not religious. And they can decide what to do with the citizens based on their criteria. And the second law is not only establishing this moral police, but also asking and demanding from all for the all mullahs and mamams of the mosque of the country to do the same type of policing. Uh, so this one says, I order every alim, imam or cleric, if you ignore the violation of Allah's order by any friend or relative, you shall be held responsible by God in judgment day. But it's a very long, it's a very long law and decree by Amir, and basically orders all the mullahs to do that. And that's why the imams in most of the mosques, it was mandatory that they had this list of um, all residents of the area, the village, the town, and whatever, 
and then they would check and see the attendance of all people living there, whether they attend the prayers or they don't attend the prayers. And uh, they, were, they were supposed to attend. So you don't, you not only have to pray, but you have to pray in the mosque. That's, that was the requirement. And you don't, you not only have to pray, but you also have to sit there every day for at least 30 minutes if, if it's in the law of the Torah to listen to the Islamic teachings of the Imams. So Imams and the laws have, have gained a lot of authorities by the Torah. And in fact, when they research, Mullahs have been one of their main supporters because uh, they lost the authority that they had during the first Taliban ruling between 1996 and 2001. And after that, they lost all those powers and authorities that they had during the Taliban. They wanted all those things back. <clears throat> so the second thing about re restoring the religion of Allah is bringing Sharia law back to Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan has experimented with over 12 constitutions. Mm -hmm. Some of them ratified and enforced, some of them just draft and shelved. They were never enforced and ratified in Afghanistan. And if you look at all these constitutions, all of them had some references to Islam, it, from five to 42 references to Islam, Islamic values, Islamic principles, every single constitution. And the constitution of 2004 had 18 references to Islam, Islamic values, Islamic principles. The first three articles of the Constitution of 2004 was about Islamic society, Islamic governance, and Islamic laws, basically. It had a repugnant clause, which basically said that whatever law that's contradictory to Islam is not enforceable and it's basically null. So uh, to a large population of Afghanistan, that was very Islamic but it wasn't Islamic enough for the Taliban. In fact, they abolished this constitution because this was not um, Islamic. For the Taliban, Sharia law is not a source of law. Sharia law is the source of law. In other words, Quran, Hadith, and especially Hanafi jurisprudence with a particular interpretation of the Quran and the Hadith is the source of law and in fact, Originally and initially, the idea was that we had we already have these laws. We already have Quran, we already have Hadith, we already have picture jurisprudence. We don't need any other laws. Our religion is complete, our law is complete. That's what we can run by and rule the country. In addition to that, Amir, um, Amir, uh, whether it's Mullah Omar or the current Amir Habatullah. It's the representative of the sovereignty of God. It's the representative of God. He's also, it's in a lot of ways, sacred. His words are important. His words, every word is almost a regulation. Even if he sends a message and advice that's a decree for the Taliban members. So it's treat, he is treated the same as Prophet Muhammad, basically, in a lot of ways. Uh, so that's why. His decrees, his advices were the second source of the laws of the Taliban until 1997. So from the time that the movement started in 1994 to 1997, the, uh, uh, the decrees of the Amir were basically the, the second source of the law. And eventually they realized that there are all things that are not necessarily in the Quran or the Hadith or Hanafi jurisprudence, for example, administration, procedures, regulations, traffics, things like that. So they needed to make some regulations. And they started legislating, but even so, even though they have legislated, their legislation remained limited to either codification and interpretation of Islam, Islamic texts, or it's about procedures and administrative matters. So to look at the general content of the laws, around nine laws seek divine punishments uh, from the 40 laws. So over 40 laws that we have analyzed, nine of them were about divine punishments. Six laws were about worldly punishments, but those are also vague. So something like this, it's article 20 of one of the laws 
which says all detention officials have Islamic duty to provide places of ablution and shower for men and women prisoners because in the absence of such places, the officials shall be held responsible on the judgment day. So the banishment is not in this real, in this world, right? So the second law says, I order the ulama and elders of villagers to rehabilitate their non-praying and non-religious members. And if they do not learn inform and relevant agencies to punish them under the Sharia law, and a delegation of all emotion will be asked, will be tasked to investigate and pursue any violation of any attending mosque or prayers uh, and to treat the offenders based on the Sharia law. So Sharia law, Sharia law, what, what kind of punishment based on the Sharia law, right? So it only says, so only says you have to be punished based on the, based on the Sharia law, but you know, what kind of Sharia law what what type of punishment are we talking about? Is it prison? Is it what kind of Sharia punishment, right? And another law, which is not necessarily about the punishment, he just prays for the for his uh, all the ranks and files. I pray for your triumph and success in both worlds. So 19, which makes almost half of the Taliban laws that we have examined, are about some divine purposes. And we're gonna look at some of those laws. 15 laws are about, as I said, administrative and procedural issues, uh, which were not necessarily uh, uh, within the politics. And 35 laws compared to the Taliban not to the people. So even if they created a law that was for the people, instead of Directing the law to the people, the laws were mostly directed to the Taliban branch and files. And mostly the laws would begin that Assalamu alaikum to the bank and files of their Taliban or their officials of the Taliban. So basically the law refers to the Taliban. So in other words, instead of the law telling the people what to do and not to do, the law would tell the Taliban how to enforce certain issues on the people. So the the Taliban is the medium, right? And Amir is not visible. The previous Amir was not visible to the people. People never saw him. The current Amir is not visible to people. People have never seen him. Not at least his face. So we only know, have some pictures of them. So and almost all of the laws have references to religion, Islam, or Fekka, or some Islamic values. And it's important to know that the Taliban have a very literalist and textualist approach to the Sharia. So when they look at the Quran, they don't look at the context. They don't get any other meanings, but how it's mentioned within those sentences, verses uh, within the Quran and Hadith. So they take it on face value, they look at it, the text, and that's how they interpret it. They look at no other thing. And that's why, and that impacts the approach to rights. So when it's about human rights or women rights, they would only, if they find it within the Quran explicitly, then it's a right and then would include it in their law. So one of their laws, it was about, for example, you cannot force a, a widow into a marriage because it was explicitly mentioned in the Quran. But it, the same law does not talk about, for example, women education. Well, the same law does not talk about, for example, about uh, child marriage or forcing child to marry because it's not explicitly mentioned in the holy text. So if they don't find it, then it cannot be part of their laws. It's a very textualist. And at the same time, uh, the laws are duty oriented rather than rights oriented. Duty oriented in the sense that it mostly talks about your duty and obligation to do. So for example, instead of saying that a widow has the right to uh, free choice in terms of marriage, the law would tell a man that he cannot force, you have obligation duty not to force a, a woman to, a widow to uh, to get married to someone that you want. So uh, it's very duty oriented um, uh, and a traditional approach. And instead of 
the rights explicitly mentioning that you have these rights and these rights must be protected by the state or against the state. And about the quality of laws, uh, we have uh, had a really hard time translating the laws. Uh, there were a lot of issues with the laws. So for example, a lot of decrees that were issued by the Amir of the Taliban. And remember, Amir of the Taliban is not just Amir of the Taliban, according to the Taliban. He's even not Amir of Afghanistan. He's Amir of Mumineen. He's Amir al Mumineen. He's the commander of the faithful, all of the Muslims, not just Afghanistan or the Taliban. So, uh, missing specific. So, most of the decrees he issued that does not have dates and does not have gazette numbers, issue numbers, right? And that's a very standard thing to do in terms of codification of the laws. Uh, we have had that tradition for a very long time. The Taliban is the first thing, the first region that don't have that with most of their laws. Uh, most of the laws would start with greetings and most of them would end with farewells and suggesting Mullah Amar is the servant of God. That's usually a label he would use for him in his decrees. In the form of message, some of the decrees would come in the form of messages, advices, and instructions to the members. But because the word of Amir is law in itself, everything is a decree and is published in the Gazette numbers in the Ministry of Justice, by the Ministry of Justice. Um, some of the laws would basically um, reflect the grievances and the frustration of the Taliban Amir with regard to the people not following Islam or with regard to the Taliban ranks and files not following his decrees or not following um, things that you do not see normally within a, within a law or a decree. Um, you could also find uncodified paragraphs, lengthy and big sentences, so one sentence would go on and on and on and on, like for a paragraph or two. Um, we have to cut them short when we translate them. And we had a really hard time translating them because uh, we, we had to balance between the two very important principles of translation. The first thing is you want to be honest and see, see in terms of translating. So, you know, you want to translate what's there, but at the same time, if you translate it how it's better there, then it's going to be very difficult for people to understand what's, what's mentioned there. So we had to uh, juggle a lot with that. Frequent grammar errors, and sometimes you would see, for example, to the pronoun of I, we, you, they usually don't see that, see that in standard uh, laws and codifications, but you can usually see that. And sometimes you see this different pronouns used for the same group of people in the same law. Um, here is a number of examples. For example, this decree does not have official gazette, does not have uh, a date. Um, and this is another decree that uses different pronouns. I have translated them over here and there. Different pronouns for the same group of people. Uh, and here you can see that, you know, the sentence goes on and on and there's no end to it. But then here we have tried to split it into smaller sentences to make it accessible to our international audience. Okay, so the last one, re-Islamizing Afghanistan. So the perception for this thing is that Afghanistan was not Islamic before the Taliban, the first regime and the second regime. And the, most, the Muslim people of Afghanistan were not Muslim or pure Muslim according to Taliban. So um, restoring the religion means to re-Islamize the country. And what do, what do they mean by that? So one of the laws says, since the rule of the time were not interested in the religion in Sharia, because of that, the people were not enlightened. And here it says the nation was less informed because the past rulers were not interested in, in teaching Islam or Sharia law to the people. Now people are not enlightened. And the other law says, do not tolerate non-worshipping and other inappropriate behavior in your agencies, since your agencies and centers are the centers of jihad. And I already mentioned a couple of other laws 
the particular issued for the Ministry of Vice and Virtue, for other agencies, and for the laws and amounts of different masks. To making sure that people are re Islamized, they have to come back to the mosque, they have to do their prayers, they have to grow beers, they have to have traditional clothes, they have to have hijabs. And the best kind of hijab, according to the recent law of the Taliban, the best kind of hijab is not to get out of home. That's, that's mentioned a lot. You have to wear your clothes, everything, but the best thing to do is just not get out of home, particularly not with a male. And this is a couple of other things which also tells us a little bit about the restoration and re-Islamization of Afghanistan. This year, Ministry of Education at one point suggested that those educated in the past 20 years are useless. And the Ministry of um, uh, Justice suggested that those worked in the past 20 years are infidels. Um, and the Ministry of Higher Education, another point suggested that I'm talking about the current regimes. I'm sorry, I get confused and going between back and forth between the two regimes. But the point is, there has, no, there has not been any change between the two rulings of the Taliban. It's the same people. So he says all professors are under surveillance. And he suggests that you have to, you cannot say anything against Islam, you cannot say anything about the Taliban. If you, and if you say, quote unquote, you will not see the next sun or the next morning. So that's the message of the Taliban. So thank you very much. Um, I'm open to questions. Yeah, I could just back up one. I, my question was about the educated. Now, assuming, I mean, that none of these people, none of the Taliban have been to college and obviously that, but even, or even high school, but the education that they have, is it all just learning about the, um, the Quran and, and, or do they have any experience in learning about the bigger world or about mathematics or I mean the things that those people use to make the world go around. That's a very important question. And and I often uh, last year I wrote an op about this. There was a lot of talk about, for example, there was a concern about and still uh, people still could go to college. They could not go to the secondary school, but they could go to college and there was they were some concerns about you know the Taliban banning women education, which eventually go to college. Sorry, the Taliban. No, no, women, female students. Sorry, I'm starting from somewhere else. I'll, I'll, I'll come. I'll, yeah. Um, just to answer your questions directly, so that I don't go in, in um, sideways. As not in take college education, they went to madrasas, mostly in along the borders inside Pakistan, and they have. As you said, all education they got was religious education and not any kind of religious education, the most extremist version of Islamic education that, they, that you could get anywhere in the world. So and that's that's how their view and worldview is basically shaped. And and that's my argument mostly that when we're talking about women education, we shouldn't just say women should go to school, women should be able to go to school. We should also talk about the quality of education that women will get at the schools and will get at the universities. Because the Taliban, sometimes they make excuses, sometimes they argue that we're gonna change the curriculum, we're gonna bring back women to colleges and universities. That scares me even more because then what kind of curriculum are we gonna teach to the students, right? I'm not even sure that, you know, they have made a, they, they have lied a lot, a, about a lot of things. But even if they, even if we agree that they are honest about this, I'm scared about the kind of curriculum that they're gonna bring to the schools. And we already are aware of some extremist version of the curriculum that they have been themselves learning at the madrasas they are planning to bring back at schools and universities. And uh, so uh, when we talk about re-Islamization, it's basically re and re extremization, not re extremization of the whole nation of Afghanistan. That would include women if they bring women back to schools. 
Let's go back to the Council of Ministers. Does it meet regularly or is it totally informal? And secondly, does it have to appear? Does it have to submit everything to the Amir in order to get sanctified? I mean, I'm just curious what that process at the top is. I assume you've got a cluster of ministers with special orientation. Do they meet collectively at all? Or do they just wait around for the Amir to make a pronouncement? It's, it's not clear. Yeah, they have their own chancellors, so they, they have their presidents, uh, and, and they were regularly meeting and they were making decisions for all of the ministries. For example, if any ministry would draft a law, they would basically send it to the Ministry of Justice. Ministry of Justice would basically review it, look at its Islamic perspective, and make, bring some other codification reforms into it, and then would send it to this Ministry of uh, this Council of Ministers, but who would then make does, does the yeah. Council have any collective responsibility? Yeah, yeah, they had some collective responsibility, both in terms of execution, but also in terms of reviewing the laws. Who would then whether it's their decision about, for example, in executive projects, policy making, decision making processes, or about, for example, legislations, it has to be approved, first of all, by another council, which is what was called the Supreme Council or Caretaking Council, which is located in Kandahar. And then it had to be again issued by Amir. So, Amir, everything has to go through Amir. Amir, Amir is the supreme leader of the team. Can the Amir issue an oral presence? I mean, is it oral or does it have to be written down? Yeah, it's it's mostly written down. And sometimes the interesting thing about the Amir's decree is that in one of the laws, the Amir, it seems the Amir is not because it seems that he did not take the track of all the decrees he issued. And at one point, he basically issues another decree to all the ministries and agencies and tells them that if you have my decrees, you have to send it to the Ministry of Justice to register that because it has got messy, basically. Yeah. Uh, but he has not had any kind of oral speeches or talks to the public. Not at all. Please. When the public speakers thought of one sometimes, they would have the traditional codes of conduct within the Afghan, particularly the Afghan community. Did they in their law also refer to both Afghan and Islamic as two principles of violence? Yeah, interestingly, not in these laws that we looked at. Uh, but it seems that the Taliban have grown even more tribal this time than they were before. Most of the laws or for example, in, in one language, previously you could see them, for example, in Pashto and Persian, but now you can see them only in Pashto, but also you can see, for example, the policies that you have adopted recently is harsher on different minor, ethnic minorities than they were uh, in their first ruling. So in some ways, not that they weren't uh, tribalist or in some senses um, ethno-nationalist uh, in the past, but they are even harsher and worse now than they were uh, in their first rulings. I asked you a question about mm -hmm. comparing between 90s and the current phase of Taliban. Yeah. And to what extent do you see common patterns which might tell us something on, about continuity of the governance model of Taliban so back then and now? And also about their perception of state building, because Afghanistan is, is the course of state building. Many of the institutions are young or they do not exist. Uh, the scholars earlier, when they were talking about laws of Taliban, they also highlighted the fact that Taliban were one of the governments which produced so many regulations. Um, so how do you see that and how can we understand the philosophy of governance of Taliban um, through their laws, if, if, if you put aside the other dimension, which is ideology. Right. I don't see a lot of differences between their ideology in terms of governance and, and, and things like that between then and now. The only difference I see is the context is a little bit different. So in 1996, when they took over Kabul, the situation was different. 
right? So different political parties, different factions, ethnic factions were fighting each other, telling each other people were tired of and people wanted some groups. And initially when the Taliban took over, people were actually happy. They said, okay, we got at least security here. And, and when they took over and after two, three weeks, a man, a couple of months, people realized, okay, it's, it's, it's even worse than what was going on before then. But now when the first time the Taliban took over this time, people were in a totally different situation. Yeah, there were some issues, government was corrupt, people were not happy with the government, but people had a lot of freedoms. Women could go to school, people could go to school, go to work, and uh, they have learned a great deal, for example, about science, about a lot of things. And they have gained a lot of, for example, civil society was uh, very mobile, active, and, and, and flourishing in Afghanistan. So the situation was really different. And this time Taliban took over, we saw a lot of movements going on. For example, women protests began, black protests began in different parts of the country. The resistance had begun in different parts of the countries. So there was a lot of backlashes from the people, the things that we did not see in the first time the Taliban took over Afghanistan. So that pushed for the Taliban in some ways to basically enforce the same laws, but only gradually. So the first time they took over Afghanistan, they basically on day one they started, for example, they implementing their laws about, for example, hijab, beard, and everything. But now they are trying to do it more gradually. At the same time, the first time they took over, it seemed that they, did not, they were not interested in terms of getting international support, uh, or at least financial support. But this time around, they do do, and that also in some ways. Um, forces the Taliban not necessarily to change their laws, to change their ideas and their thinking and way of governing, but only to, for example, lie to the international community and suggest that we are different, we are Taliban 2.0, which has been actually propagated a lot by the United States diplomat more than the Taliban. And, uh, uh, but the Taliban took advantage of that. At the same time, this gradual implementation of the law was something that in some ways was a response to, you know, the, the public reaction against their entrance in Afghanistan, as well as the international pressure against the Taliban, something that they didn't care about um, uh, in their first ruling of Afghanistan. But as, as we can see, they are implementing the same rules and laws only gradually this time. So they brought back <clears throat> logging, right? Months and years after this time, after they took over, they brought back the sauce, for example, they brought back uh, um, stoning, right? How so, many of their previous yeah. laws are restored at this stage? Yeah. Um, uh, exactly. I, I have not taken a look. Well, I've read some of the laws. But I cannot exactly say. So. I've not looked at all of the laws to say that, for example, they have restored the same laws. But I can only say that they have reinvent, reinvented the same laws and extended the same laws. So, for example, about the law on, uh, on widow rights to marriage, they have extended that law and published it very at the very beginning of their governance this, this time because they want international financial support and they want to say, okay, we have. We have this law about women rights and they have tied entitled it women rights. But it's basically the same law with a couple of more articles uh, talking about women rights. So this time they are more tactical, strategic in terms of uh, getting international support, but they have not done sideways in terms of their ideas when you go to the laws. And I'm thinking they're gonna they are moving back to its 1996 because, you know, women were allowed at the beginning to go to universities, but they gradually, you know, first they start uh, banning secondary education for women, then uh, professional colleges, and then they went to universities and then primary education. So this time they are more strategic in terms of enforcing the same laws. So maybe the words are different, but the law is the same, the content is the same, the idea of governance is the same. This is something that I've always sort of wondered about, and 
um, I, uh, between us with the two times that the top down was the order, I'm sure people got used to using cell phones, using computers, school and everyone else, and, and for work and everything like that. Now, there's nothing in the Quran that says it's okay to use a cell phone or a computer or anything like that. So just from that alone, you would think that they would ban it because it's not in the Quran. Um, or do they have some, and I have not seen anything on your slides about any kind of technology council or technology um, right. control. And yet it says up there that they that their duties are to prevent anti-Islamic advertising. Right. And there's probably a lot of advertising on their internet right. that is anti-Islamic. So how are they preventing it and controlling it? Or right. are they or is, are they allowing it? Yeah. How oh so uh right now i'm not really sure if it's written somewhere in the laws that you do check your cell phone so you can carry it but then you're gonna come over and say okay open your cell phone and then i'm gonna go through your contents and see what's going on over there and they will arrest or punish people on the spot so right now that's what they're doing but i'm guessing they are going to regulate it in some ways and it's going to go under their uh, those laws about administrative and procedural laws. And that was things that are not within, as you say, the holy text. So they have to create some form of regulations for that. Because, you know, as you said, you know, there are different types of contents and they, they fear that. So yeah, that's, and that's it. In the Quran, it you right. And they have mentioned a couple of times about technology in their laws between 1996 to 2001 as well. So things that are not in the Quran, they can legislate it, regulate it. If it's within the Quran, then it's within the Quran, and it's the law. Does the Quran say anything about taxation? Yeah, well, it does talk about a, a little bit about different forms of Islamic, you could say Islamic taxation, for example, zakat and so on. And they do talk about it in their laws as well. So, And uh, when they research in Afghanistan, they would actually force people to pay uh, mm, their Islamic taxes to people yeah, in the areas they have controlled. Right. It's, it's Yeah, so they have a specific amount when they were researching across Afghanistan, they would usually take this money and usually it would be taken by their soldiers and the soldiers would use it for, for war or their personal family. Uh, issues they would not send it back to, for example, near uh, Shura, Kuwait Shura, or Miran Shura, for example, which were in Pakistan. But uh, they would usually use it either for war or for personal and family expenses. Um, and they do have a different kind of, uh, I forgot the term, they, and it's, 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 uh, there's a particular term for uh, non Muslims that they have to pay extra amount of tax for the Taliban. And for the Taliban, that doesn't only include, for example, people who actually religiously are non-Muslims, but it also includes, for example, the Shiites of Afghanistan, who are uh, you know, followers of a different sect of Islam. They also have to pay some extra amount of money and tax. The second half of my question is about, do they have any, are they doing any, control of, of what's on the internet. Um, and no, no, so they are not savvy in terms of computer. What they were savvy in terms savvy of, they, they were, they were very, I mean, they were really good, at least their supporters or um, they were very savvy in terms of propagating the ideas of Taliban 2.0 and the Taliban winning the war in Afghanistan. And in fact, if you compare, for example, how they were active on the social media versus how members of the government, the Republic government during the war was act, you know, active in terms of propagating uh, and propaganda, Taliban were much more successful. Um, but in terms of controlling you know, the technology, the, 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 the internet and, and the websites, they are not there. But because China is supporting the Taliban, 
So there's there's danger, you know, on that issue because they can't get that those technology from China. Back up. You said China yes. is going to tell that. China is, China is yeah, China is supporting Tao. <laughs> China actually was the first country that provided around $30 million to the Tao when they took over first Afghanistan, uh, which they call humanitarian aid. So um and they have embassy open in Afghanistan. And yeah. I would say most of the countries in the regions were supporting the Taiwan. That would include China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, Pakistan in particular. Last question if I ask you is um, in terms of Taliban groups, what would help us to, to, to differentiate between conceptually between the term governance and the two and the term um, control? Governance is much more broader wherein you provide services. Um, and they and, and at the same time you have extensive efficient bureaucratic capacity mm -hmm. to not just regulate but also provide the opportunity for the establishment to provide services. But Taliban, based on the laws that you um, reviewed, yeah. they're primarily focused on um controlling the behavior of people, uh, moral policing of them. Um, so, th so that's why I think that in terms of philosophy of rule, right. Taliban doesn't have the logic of governance, but what they do is only control. Right. Uh, and and what, what is that? The second element is also that when a Taliban rule, one of the key modern ideas, which is a Gillian distinction between public sphere and private sphere is mm -hmm. collapsing. Because Taliban continuously and regularly intervene on issues which are coming under the domain of private sphere. For example, right. how do you wear clothes or your thoughts, for example, and also the way that they confine women totally to the private sphere, wherein gender-wise, man is, according to their philosophy, uh, is allowed in public sphere, but woman is not allowed. And so in the 90s, they also developed a certain rules and regulations how people should cover their windows, where mm -hmm. women should not be even visible when they are walking inside the room. Um, so I think that distinction between governance on one hand and control on the other hand will mm -hmm. help us to, to unpack the all of one's behavior. Right, so if, if you define governance in the way that you define, you can totally argue that the Taliban were not governing, they were only controlled. You can, for the Taliban, it was governing. And, and uh, so uh, and, and you're right about the Taliban establishing a uh, theocratic totalitarian regime in terms of, for example, removing the distinction between morality and law and between the public and private spaces of individuals and, and control people in their total to, to, totality, which includes, for example, what you can hear, which basically as you cannot hear music, what you can watch, which you cannot watch, which means you cannot watch movies and, 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 and TV shows and things like that. And what you can wear, which has to be a job for women and traditional clothes for men and in terms of, for example, having beards and certain types of hair or different shapes of hair. Um, so it was, it's a totalitarian in the sense that it controls, controls you in your totality. Whether you're home, you're outside, you're on your own person or within a society, your social affairs, personal affairs, everything has to be regulated by the tolerance. All right, uh, I think with that note. Can, can I ask what? Sure. Uh, this is probably a quick question. Maybe not, though. What does the Quran say about inheritance? And I mean, in the Taliban, I, I'm assuming that when a man dies, the woman does not get it. But uh, what does the Taliban say and how does the, uh, what yeah. does the Quran say and how does the Taliban yeah, interpret so, it? Yeah, so. So in the Quran, it, it does talk about inheritance. And this and the Quran does give different 
levels of shears for different uh, years of an individual, for example, for son, for daughter, for example, for father, mother, brother, sister, and so on. And the tall one does implement that uh, because it's explicitly mentioned within the Quran, right? And in the Quran does say, for example, woman gets half a share of a man, and that's what the tall one says. So the woman will inherit it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Allow that? Right, That's right. Surprising. Yeah, it's it's within the cross, so they, they do allow. I wouldn't think they much. <laughs> One of the first decrees that Amir al mm. Mumin, the leader of Taliban, gave with respect mm. to women, yeah, was acknowledging that the women are entitled to inheritance, but mm. also a couple of other limited rights which are enshrined in Sharia. Yeah. But when it comes to, for example, right to work, yeah. education. Yeah. Which engages women and brings them out, brings them out from private sphere to public sphere, then that is something which they should think about it. I just think that they, I, I would have thought that they, the Taliban wouldn't expect that women could, would know how to run the house without the man, just, you know, telling her what to do. That mm -hmm. they would give give it to, uh, uh, not give it to, but allow the woman to inherit it is surprising. So, well, in Islamic philosophy, as it was also highlighted here, uh, the Islamic philosophy is inherently driven by a duty-based kind of philosophy, not entitlement to right. Um, so even when it comes to inheritance, it is not right of a woman, it is duty of a man to ensure that woman has that proper amount of share. And of course, that share is not equal to man. For example, if a woman dies, the widow will receive one eighth of the property, so that the property will be divided between sons, and daughters, and the wife. Oh. So the wife does not receive equal amount when it comes to the rest. Only one eighth will be, will go to the wife. So the same as well between son and son and daughter. So the daughter will receive half of the share of the son. So that kind of inequality in distribution of wealth is there when it comes to inheritance. Yeah. Anyway, so I think with that note, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, thank you. And, and we will also like to thank those who uh, joined us online. Yes, um, um, can I ask you, would you mind if I share this, uh, your presentation with um, our members online? No. <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead. Yeah. Can I share it? Can yeah, please. Yeah. Right now on yes. This? Yeah, they wanted to get the lighting. Not able to sure, sure. Yeah. All right, so have a nice day then. Thank you Thanks. very much.